Hello, good morning. My name is Lizzie Aldrich. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Blue Source. And welcome to our webinar on unlocking corporate action on climate change. We've got Interface and Microsoft with us today to talk about this topic, and we're excited to dive in. This will be a 90-minute webinar, and um, really looking forward to maximizing every minute of it. A few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar is recorded, and uh, there's the opportunity to write questions in the chat function of GoToMeeting. Um, we will mute all participants except the speakers, and um, we will have about 15 minutes for myself, followed by about 25 minutes for Interface and 25 minutes for Microsoft to speak. After that time, we'll have a great Q&A session. All right, with that, let's get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining after the holiday weekend. I know everyone's inbox is probably full, and so we do appreciate your time. So first I'll give an introduction to who our speakers are. I'll tell you a bit about who Blue Source is and what some of the common challenges that we've noticed are to corporates taking action on climate change and some suggestions for how to overcome those challenges. Next, we'll hear from Interface and then Microsoft, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So first, a bit about me. My name is Lizzie Aldrich, and I've been in the world of carbon markets since 2004 when I did my PhD in the field. At the time, I was focused on compliance markets within the clean development mechanism, and it's really been encouraging to see the growth of voluntary markets uh, since that time. It's a really exciting time to be in the space. Next, we have Mikhail Davis. He's the Director of Technical Sustainability at Interface, a world-leading modular flooring company. Interface's mission, Climate Takeback, invites industry to commit to making a profit in a way that is restorative to the planet and creates a climate fit for life. Mikhail is responsible for building internal leadership capacity and creating external partnerships and sustainability. He serves as the 2016 through 2019 Chair of the USGBC's Materials and Resources Technical Advisory Group and is a Certified Biomimicry Specialist. Next, we have Elizabeth Wilmot. She leads Microsoft's Climate Carbon Program, managing the company's commitments to carbon reduction and removal. Prior to joining Microsoft in 2016, Elizabeth worked in the public and nonprofit sector on urban sustainability. She lives in Seattle with her husband and two beloved animals, and she's an avid open water swimmer. So let me take just a minute to tell you who Blue Source is. Blue Source is the oldest and largest carbon offset developer in North America. We're a full service greenhouse gas reduction company that can partner with corporates at any stage in the process of identifying their greenhouse gases and then prioritizing reductions internally and then sourcing commodities like renewable energy certificates and offsets that can be used to reduce those emissions. We also can source those commodities from projects worldwide. Um, and turning to the next slide, this is a map of where those particular instruments, RECs and offsets can be sourced for our clients all around the world. And looking at a little bit more granular view, you can see here in this map, these are the locations of where our US and Canadian based projects are. We're a turnkey operation. We identify the opportunity for reduction and take the project from start to finish, quantifying the emission reductions, working with a standards body and a third party verifier, and ultimately selling those reductions on behalf of our clients. We have 17 million metric tons of voluntary offsets that are issued and currently in our pipeline. So let's talk for a minute about why companies are voluntarily tackling emissions. So those of you who may have been in this field for a while probably remember the Waxman Markey Bill in 2009. At that time, there was the thought that federal climate action was imminent. Um, and of course, when that, that bill didn't pass the Senate, there has been this kind of long lag in, in federal action. And due to that, many voluntary actions are being taken by corporates. They, there is consumer and investor pressure to improve the ESG factors of these companies. And a lot of companies are just simply finding that taking action on climate is good for their business. 
So how are corporates engaging? There are a number of different initiatives that exist that are listed on this slide. We're not going to go through the details of each one today, but suffice it to say that they all do have their differences. And there may be some that are more appropriate to a particular industry or sector uh, based on their particular bent and how they go about quantifying um, and achieving reductions. And so this is also an area where BlueSource can help partner with folks to help them identify which of these initiatives is the most appropriate for their business. So the process of actually identifying greenhouse gases and reducing them, BlueSource breaks it down into these four different steps. First is measure your footprint. So um, in doing so, some of the challenges there are just where to begin, how to draw that line or that boundary. Next, for internal reductions, uh, the question becomes how cost effective are these and how do you prioritize those reductions? Uh, for what can't be reduced internally, looking to neutralize uh, through the purchase of RECs or offsets is a great option. However, it can be overwhelming looking at all the options available out there for these types of commodities. And then lastly, managing. How does a corporate effectively manage the messaging around what has been done and uh, making sure that the customers are aware of it and that the public perception of these activities is positive? So breaking down these challenges one by one, measuring a footprint uh, can be quite challenging in terms of thinking about the scope, where to begin. Do you reduce your scope one, two, or three emissions? And really, the way that Blue Source approaches this is a fit-for-purpose effort. So if a company has um, industrial facilities, then maybe looking at scope one of emissions is where that particular company should start. If it's a bank, and perhaps most of the emissions are really from um, employee commuting, business travel, then possibly considering scope one, two, and three emissions might be appropriate for that particular company. Next challenge is collecting data. And this can be particularly cha challenging if you're looking at uh, a company that has emissions worldwide, collecting data from all of the different offices, uh, supply chain that may span the globe. And so when doing so, it's important to use a reputable standard, like for example, the Climate Registry is, is quite well known for its greenhouse gas inventory protocol. Uh, the greenhouse gas protocol by WRI is one that's used. And then in reporting all of that into CDP, it's important that what you're reporting is transparent so that your customers can audit that and be aware of the footprint and how you've gone about collecting that footprint in a standardized way. Next challenge, reducing internally, is something that is um, really what Blue Source promotes for corporates as the very first step. What kind of reductions can be made internally? And sometimes there are also energy savings, which lead to cost savings for these. And some of these reductions, like LED lighting retrofits, can be made quite cost effectively. Then as you get into more challenging, say, insulation retrofits, they can become quite costly. And so creating a budget and a timeline for these types of reductions, and even partnering with an ESCO, which is an energy service company that can actually help finance those retrofits out of the energy savings achieved over time, can be a model that's quite effective. That does require working with a third-party entity, and so managing that relationship and the reductions made through that relationship is something new that the company will have to do. Um, and then also really considering what are some of the demands on that business, and one that we see in, in today's day and age is certainly the need for fast delivery, and that can at some point round counter to um, greenhouse gas reductions through efficiency measures. And so really trying to think about what are the priorities of your customer base and do they run counter to those greenhouse gas reductions you're trying to make through efficiency and trying to merge the two. And you can help by creating a formal energy audit and an analysis of retrofits and reduction opportunities, really comparing that with your core business. So once those internal reductions have been made, the next step is to look at environmental attributes of the pollution. And environmental attributes, again, here are offsets, renewable energy certificates, 
And so these can be purchased and applied towards a company's greenhouse gases. And it's really important as you really delve into this to understand the frameworks. What are the standards that are used for the quantification of these reductions? And how transparent and reputable are those standards? Next, looking at how a particular purchase of an instrument like this might align with a company's goals, vision, and culture is important. Many of these projects, for example, offset projects may have ancillary benefits, co-benefits that go along with them. And it's, it's great because you're not only having that greenhouse gas reduction, but you can help support a UN sustainable development goal at the same time. But you do want to make sure those offset projects that you choose are going to align with um, the, the mission of the overall company. So as, as an example, supporting cook stoves in Africa that is going to reduce deforestation and um, sequester carbon in that way is really important because you could certainly look at that from the standpoint of improving ventilation within households that use these cook stoves and that may align with the priorities of say a healthcare company and so it's really a neat way to both support your carbon reductions and also other sustainable development goals that a company may hold near and dear and lastly simplifying the complex and so when you do begin to look at these instruments there's a variety of options available in the marketplace working with a trusted partner that can help you narrow those options by your priorities for geography, technology, standard type, can really help you to um, better understand what might be most appropriate for your company. And lastly, managing the perception of whatever activities you have taken is quite important. Um, you wanna make sure that once you have made those internal reductions and perhaps purchased instruments for the reductions you can't make internally, that you don't have any kind of perception of greenwashing out there. You wanna make sure that you're effectively conveying what you've done internally and how you may have purchased instruments for those emissions that you cannot reduce internally. Um, and if you have purchased instruments to help with your reductions outside of your fence line or your border, you want to make sure that you are aware of what are the critical views of offsets that do exist in the marketplace that may be remnants of old offset marketplaces that were just information and development in the early 2000s. And since that time, these standards bodies have become ro more robust, the protocols have become more transparent, and how offsets are quantified um, has really improved as it's the arguments for why the offset is additional to a business as usual situation has been improved. So it's important to understand what those views may be so that you can effectively debunk any myths about those offsets and then also effectively convey why you have chosen the ones that you have chosen and what ancillary benefits they may support. And those ancillary benefits, making sure that they do align with your overall sustainability strategy and how you can effectively communicate and message that. And so with that, I appreciate your time and I'm going to pass it over to Mikhail Davis at Interface. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Wonderful to have you join us today. Uh, Blue Source has been a wonderful long-term partner of Interface in addressing all of our, our larger uh, carbon goals. And I'm gonna give you a bit of the context in which we have partnered and used carbon offsets, as Lizzie said, it's really important to carbon offsets, even really good carbon offsets, you know, that have a wonderful co-benefits and put a human face on, you know, a carbon offset, which is otherwise kind of a dry, you know, not so interesting tool, but actually have a real benefits to real people and real communities. Those are wonderful, but they do not a strategy make no matter how many you buy. So I'm gonna, gonna let you under the hood a bit of Interface's larger strategy with regard to carbon offsets um, and climate change. Because in this day and age, every company needs to have a strategy for how to address climate change. All right. So I call this this from carbon neutral, which is very much what, what Blue Source helps us with, to climate take back, a carbon love story. And we'll talk about why I gave it that pr provocative title. 
So CDP or some sort of reporting tool is normally what we see for large corporate entities. This is becoming more and more, especially for publicly traded companies, especially for large publicly traded companies, you report to some entity like CDP or the climate registry. Maybe they give you a score. Maybe you just have your, your GHC footprint up there. But unfortunately, like a lot of corporate reporting, that's as far as it goes. This CDP, reporting to CDP, also does not a climate strategy make. So we can have the most aggressive goals in the world, and because of small details of how we report, we get a B. Doesn't really tell you the story. Doesn't really tell you the story of does this company really have a strategy? Is this company really doing all that it should be doing on climate, or are they just reporting really well? So to keep in mind why I don't think a lot of the, the tools we see for just reporting are adequate, climate change is often framed as this sort of far away thing. I'd like to remind people climate change is, if you just Google number one threat to public health in the 21st century, this is it, climate change. There is there's no debate whether you talk to the Lancet or Harvard School of Public Health or Centers for Disease Control and Prevention who, who brought us this wonderful slide. All of the other big problems that we might consider big health problems, problems you know, people, be, you know, people being uh, in situations where they have malnutrition or exposed to disease, even toxic chemicals, all of these things are made far worse by destabilizing the climate. So let's, let's remember that as we think about what is an appropriate response and, and how aggressive we should be. The stakes are high. So, and also, so I mean, I'm gonna tell the same story. So with regard to carbon offsets in this larger view of beyond the traditional CDP climate registry reporting of scope one and scope two, GHG protocol reporting of our emissions. The trick with that is that for most industries, and this is from, from modular flooring, which is our world, that is not probably going to capture your biggest uh, your biggest impact so if you look at the the life cycle here you know this is for a, a typical carpet tile in this case which is you know what we invented and, and one of so one of our main products in flooring 71 percent of it occurs in your supply chain before it is even in one of your facilities in raw material extraction and processing so that's not scope one or scope two and yet it's the vast majority of your impact on the climate so as Lizzie was talking about all of these emissions we can't directly impact, for a lot of companies, that's most of them. Unless you are a really particular type of company, scope one and scope two, you're gonna miss a lot of your impact. And if our approach is to actually help solve this problem, as opposed to just looking good to investors or to consumers, we have to be very concerned about the fact that a lot of our reporting tools are not reporting our true impact. Again, here's another one from the Alan MacArthur Foundation, the Material Economics, looked at tackling emissions. It's usually talked about, especially in scope one and scope two, we're talking about we need to get better energy, which we absolutely do. But so much of it comes from how we, we manage and extract materials and put them into products. So if we're not paying attention to all the materials that we influence with our purchasing, for instance, we are not gonna, gonna get about half the pie. We could fix energy entirely and it really wouldn't address all of what we need to address in these major commodity materials. So similar idea, this was just a, a, some West Coast institutions, usually uh, mostly local government and higher education, did an analysis where they showed that operations, which is all of your, your scope one and scope two, was actually smaller than just purchasing. And scope three is this wildly diverse 16 different categories of how you influence outside of your direct emissions and, and electricity purchasing. All of that is bigger, just the purchasing aspect of that, which is only one of the 16, is bigger than all of the scope one and scope two. So again, just trying to buy green energy, which is wonderful and we should all do, is not gonna get it done. So this is our approach to solving this problem. So you have a customer who, who hopefully 
starts to realize, wow, a lot of my impact is in what I buy. What we bring to them with the help of partners like Blue Source is we are changing the game. Our fundamental communication is that your the impact on the climate of producing the product that we sell to you is our responsibility, not yours. We take full responsibility. Every product guaranteed to be carbon neutral at no extra cost, no matter whether it's a higher footprint product or a lower footprint product, it's on us. And if we can't reduce that footprint, we're gonna pay more in offsets. So some of the ways we use this program, which are called carbon neutral floors, we can actually, for a specific customer, report out their impact for them. And this is just the value of the offsets. We don't include the, the reductions that we made up front to reduce their overall footprint. So looking at it and communicating this in some useful ways, it's about educating them, but also acknowledging them for, for thinking about this in their purchasing. So equivalent to buying this amount of flooring is equivalent to taking 398 cars off the road or removing 326 homes from the electricity grid for a year. So the point is here to start to, to render this invisible impact visible, to start to give people a way to, to be acknowledged for their actions, but also to take more actions. So again, this is our, we started this program back in, in 2003 actually started a little earlier, but we, we used a carbon neutral claim to launch a whole new product category where we did randomized carpet tiles inspired by, by looking at how nature does flooring. But again, some we've been doing this for a while. We have sold a lot of carbon neutral flooring. Uh, so some fun ways to imagine that are that we, you know, the, all of the, the carpet tiles we sold could circle the earth 19 times, or we could take 1 million cars off the road for all of the offsets that we purchased. I'm not gonna go into the details of this program. You can get into the Q&A, but suffice it to say, we are very conservative in how we make a carbon neutral claim. We are making the claim for the full life cycle. So if we're selling you carpet tile, we're including the impact of vacuuming and wet extraction for seven years of maintenance, uh, in addition to what happens at end of life. It is not just our direct scope of one, scope two emissions, it is the whole thing. So anything we can't reduce, we're gonna be looking for these high quality carbon offsets. Um, so look, some of the standards we look for, verified carbon standard, climate action reserve, gold standard. And then the whole program is verified by Bureau Veritas, who says, okay, does what you did with carbon offsets match the footprint? And they verify all these calculations to say, that we truly are selling a carbon neutral product. How do you make that affordable? We are paying for all the offsets for every product we buy. You lower your footprint. We've essentially created a, a, a admittedly very small internal carbon tax per unit of flooring because we agree to buy the offsets for the full life cycle of anything that we can't eliminate. So you can see we've been on this trajectory you look back in 1996, you had over 20 kilos per square meter, and we're at 6.1. We're actually below that now and, and headed down quickly. So again, the lower you make your cradle-to-gate footprint, the easier it, may, it gets to have a carbon-neutral product. So again, if you look at the larger landscape and what's happening in carbon tile, this is just U.S. production based on EPD data. We, as you would expect for having been at this for 25 years, we, for any product you're looking at, any category, whether it's cushion or, or different types of nylon, we are the lowest. Now, that is how we can promise a carbon neutral floor, but it also shows all the work to be done because this is still measuring what we don't want to be measuring, which is how much did you contribute to climate change? So we are the least bad and we're, we're working on how do we get to the next level? So one of the ways we get there is we educate our customers to actually care that we're the lowest. This is an initiative called Materials Carbon Action Network uh, that we helped start. And the idea here is, is similar to those other things that I showed you, is that the impact, the carbon impact of our supply chains, of our vendors, of the materials we use to build buildings, in our case, we, our product is a building product, 
Um, this is assuming that we continue to make buildings more and more efficient, more and more of the climate impact of buildings is actually not from how efficient the buildings are. It's actually from what we make the buildings out of in the supply chain and how we build the buildings, all of this what we call embodied carbon, not the direct carbon from operating the building. So here's two of the key initiatives that we have. Materials Cam, which is really about, we were partnered with, with Gensler, largest architecture firm in the world. And a lot of our other key partners here are about trying to get people to start keeping score on embodied carbons. Now, that's a new thing. So we also, with the help from Microsoft and some other key partners, launched a tool to help them do it. That goes out and helps them find for building products, what is the embodied carbon of each and what are my best options in each product category. We've got nine product categories that launched at Green Build last November. Um, more will be added, but this is really, we need to make, make making easier, making better choices on climate easier. And so we're really trying to bring this to our own customers in the building sector. But the thing I wanna talk about here, looking at the larger strategy, we just celebrated 25 years um, since our founder's epiphany, I can tell you the first 20 years, we weren't doing anything in sustainability. We weren't doing anything that wasn't required by, by local law. And so really, starting 25 years ago, we, we started to understand our impact, which frankly was sobering, and started to look at how could we really transform our company from a source of environmental problems to a solution to environmental problems. So we issued this report rather than doing another corporate sustainability report. As far as we know, we were the first in North America to ever do a corporate sustainability report back in 1997 when that was a radical idea. Now, of course, it's very mainstream. So we didn't think celebrating 25 years with a report that just reported on all the cool stuff we were doing was really the appropriate way to do it. So really started looking at what have we learned along the way that might help others. And I'm not going to go into all the details of this, but I'll give you a quick overview of what's in the report. Because this is really what it's about. This is where you bring in your carbon offsets. You have to build a strategy. You have to build something that works for your business, that makes you a better business, and makes the changes we need in the world. So again, there's, there's nine lessons. I'm going to walk you through them real quickly. Lesson one. Shoot, shoot for the moon, you have to have a goal that is aligned with what science says the world needs. But also the wonderful thing that we had to learn, and again, initially people thought our founder, who was the only one who had the epiphany, was crazy. And eventually we came to understand that, that having a goal that initially looks a lot like this old New Yorker cartoon is actually an amazing thing. If you put yourself in a position where you calculate where you are and you know where you want to go and you have no idea how to get there, you're in the miracle making business, which it turns out is an amazing business to be in and has generated the kind of engagement and innovation that we never would have dreamed was possible if we had not taken on a goal that truly seemed impossible and that required miracles. Great business to be in, it turns out. So changing mindset, this is again, you saw a lot of what we're doing on carbon. One of the big challenges has been to get people to understand what we're trying to do. So first we had to change our, our mindsets internally, but we really have focused a lot on trying to get our customers and other stakeholders to change their mindset and to think about these things. We've also worked a lot with other companies that we have nothing to do with. Anybody that wants to go in this journey, we want to help them because that's going to make it easier for all of us in the future. Every vision needs a plan. Our, our founder is an engineer. You know, he loved the old quote. He said, uh, in God we trust, all others bring data. So the first thing we had to do is create an actual holistic measurable plan. You know, some of the, the key things we decided to measure, you know, back before, this was before GRI existed. So, there were, you know, the people who started GRI came to us and said, wow, why are you doing this? What are, what are you doing? What are you reporting on? Some of our core metrics, you know, now we've come quite a ways since we invented them back in 1996. Um, you can see this is for the carpet tile business. We've since expanded, expanded into hard surface and rubber and a few other things, but this is our legacy business. We've 
you know, managed to make these dramatic reductions. You saw 69% I showed you on the carbon footprint makes it a lot easier to get to carbon neutral. In terms of our scope one and scope two, that's down 96%. So these are, these are things that we're just, our businesses to show that they are possible for a for-profit global publicly traded company. Um, we're not a B Corp. We don't have any of the special rules operating by the same rules as every other publicly traded company, and yet we can do this at a profit. So circularity, another key lesson, turned out to be way harder than we thought, but it's absolutely crucial if you want to reduce your impact on the climate. Can't keep extracting all the new materials and throwing them away. We need everyone, and this again goes back to education. The first thing we had to do was get our own people on board. It took Ray and years of doing internal talks before he felt like he had his own people understanding what this new sustainability mission was. Um, and you know, this created our, made our employees feel inspired. He liked to say to them, okay, you can come to work every day to create carpet, or you can come to work every day to create history. And our employees <laughs> overwhelmingly chose making history a lot more exciting. And this is, just an insight that especially every tech company knows wrong turn lead to the right result. You have to have be okay with failure. You have to try things and keep learning rigorously from each thing that you try, even if it doesn't work the way you thought it would. Be transparent. This is, is a tough one if your legal team is riding out front too much. Um, because you need to be willing, as we did in that report back in 1997, as we did when we published our first environmental product declarations, you need to be willing to share the bad news. You need to be willing to share the work yet to be done. And this, to me, is where a lot of the, the corporate social responsibility reporting has fallen short, is it ends up just being more of putting your best foot forward. Oh, well, we're doing this one really cool thing in this one place, not really showing the picture of all the work yet to be done to get you to where you want to be in terms of the kind of company you want to be, in terms of truly being sustainable, and maybe even restorative. And the other thing that we've, we've been aware of is that our impact alone, if we created the most perfect, sustainable, even restorative manufacturing company ever and didn't get other companies engaged, we wouldn't really have changed the world. And the point is to actually solve the problem, not just to win market share. We like to win market share and all these other good things, but we actually also want to spread these ideas. That's why we do reports like this. Some of the impacts we've had on other companies like Walmart and others that are way bigger than us. Um, you know, if you look at some of the cool stuff Nike has done over the years, um, we spent a lot of time with them. We spent a lot of time trying to make sure that other companies also get on board with this mission. If it's just our mission, we haven't succeeded. And finally, raise the bar. You know, we've come a long way on our initial mission, which was all about eliminating our own negative footprint. But when we asked our employees who, again, we got them all engaged, what is the new mission? Our, our mission was supposed to sunset in 2020 declared success on that because we've realized there's a much bigger goal. We need to get everyone on board with actually taking on climate change. And so the new mission meets the criteria which our employees gave us, which it has to sound impossible. Okay, we're going to make flooring in a way that helps reverse global warming. Does that sound impossible? Great. Check. So this is fundamentally our thesis now for the new mission as we raise the bar. Humanity changed the climate by mistake. We can change it with intent. Just imagine if we were actually trying to change the climate as opposed to just building an economy and some other things where we accidentally changed the, the climate. And the goal, again, back to lesson number one, have a moonshot, have a goal worth having. Let's not have a goal of Less than two degrees centigrade change does not inspire me. In layman's terms, that means let's have a climate that doesn't suck too bad. I think we can actually aspire to something greater if we get our minds around this and start to leverage human, human ingenuity. We want a climate fit for life. 
on a climate in which we can all thrive. How do we do that? We need a plan. Again, back to <laughs> lesson number three from our own lessons learned. Every vision needs a plan. We think there are at least four pillars of what it will take to reverse climate change. Live zero, which is very much what we've been doing to, to eliminate impact. Love carbon. Again, this is a carbon love story, in case you've forgotten from the title. Let nature cool. Nature already knows how to do what we're already tr what we're trying to do. And lead another industrial revolution. This is something that's going to require change everywhere. This is not a small change. Business as usual will not get it done. So I'm going to dig in on a couple of these real quickly just to show you the mindset shift here about our new carbon strategy. So love carbon. We have to stop seeing carbon as an enemy and start using it as a resource. We've been doing carbon disclosure projects and reporting on carbon and doing all these things to reduce carbon. And yet it isn't really carbon that's the problem. It's the wasting of the carbon by throwing it all into the atmosphere that's the problem. It's the taking all this nicely, safely stored carbon that we had under the ground from you know, eons past and throwing that in the atmosphere, fossil fuels. It's not carbon that's the problem. We're all made of carbon. Life is made from carbon. Life handles carbon in a totally different way than we've been handling it. Life builds cool things with carbon. So again, back to this slide. This is the live zero, reduce carbon as much, carbon is bad paradigm. The competition we really want to be in is to have these bars go the other way. Whose product took the most carbon out of the atmosphere net net? Not who's less bad. So in the love carbon world, this slide gets turned on its head and everyone needs to be competing to drive things the other direction, put the bars the other way. In a carbon emissions world, we call that carbon negative because uh, we've been used to measuring carbon emissions. So we want to have negative emissions, which means we need to store carbon in our products. So this was our first, we, we launched this about two years ago to show that it could be done. We did a prototype, kind of your concept car. Or rather than what well, then we had an average of seven kilos into the atmosphere from cradle to gate, you know, from where we're producing the product, the whole manufacturing supply chain, seven kilos into the atmosphere. This product actually took two kilos out of the atmosphere, leveraging a lot of uh, plant based materials because, again, plants already know how to do what we want to do, which is suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and build something cool with it. Again, Turning this whole thing on its head, wonderful book. I got to help write a chapter of what if we could, for every building product, actually select materials that took more carbon out of the atmosphere than got put in to make them? We could actually have buildings that are built from stored carbon that actually help cool the climate. So definitely check out Bruce King's book. And this is the love carbon approach to architecture. We turn our relationship with carbon around. So let nature cool. If we stopped putting all this, this fossil carbon into the atmosphere, nature would naturally stabilize the climate. If we let these natural carbon sinks do what they do, um, we would have no problem. So we need to, to make sure we keep natural carbon sinks um, in mind as part of our larger strategy. I know Microsoft has that as part of theirs. So this is a provocative idea we throw out. What if our factories could do what a forest does? We, you know, it's not enough to have a zero carbon emission factory. You know, not, we, our old mission was called Mission Zero. One of our key advisors, Janine Ben, just challenged us to think in terms of generosity. How do we have a generous factory that actually makes things around it better, including the climate? What if we, you know, we, so we've actually benchmarked several of our factories globally against the, what that, that local ecosystem that would be where that factory is. Turns out it's a forest in all of our factory locations. Then we measured in local national parks and other intact local ecosystems, what was it doing? What was it providing? One of the key things you see right away is that all these ecosystems do not emit carbon, they store carbon. Can our factories do that? Could we turn our factories into our own carbon offsets? Could we turn our products and our supply chain into our own carbon offsets? That's really the future, and what it enables us to, to look at is how do we have products that are carbon negative? How do we reverse climate change, as our advisor Paul Hawken advised us in his book, Drawdown, 
there are so many solutions out there and we're looking at what's going to work for our business. And what I really want all of you to be thinking about is how could you go further? We're going to have carbon negative factories. We're going to have carbon negative products because we do factories and products, but every business has a way to get in this game. So look at Drawdown, 100 scalable, profitable solutions that can help us you know, reverse climate change. Project Gigaton, wonderful Walmart initiative. You know, actually looking in their supply chain, that huge chunk of over 50% emissions that we talked about at the top, that's all in the supply chain. We got to take responsibility for that too and start thinking in gigatons, <laughs> 1 billion tons. This is the level at which action needs to occur to solve this problem. We need to have these meaningful goals. We need to engage our suppliers. We need to actually start to address the problem at the true scale it exists, not just do really good reporting or do incremental improvements. You know, so Project Gigaton, how about Project Terraton? <laughs> Exponentially larger than a gigaton. So this is uh, out, of, uh, out of Iowa, out of farm country. We're looking at, you know, Indigo Agriculture has said we can sequester at least a teraton of carbon if we change the way we do agriculture. So these are examples of addressing the problem at the scale that it truly exists. And that's what I want to encourage us. We have to start somewhere. We have to start taking responsibility for our carbon. We have to get the offsets. We have to work with partners who can do it when we can't do it. But we also have to aspire to truly solve the problem. So finally, if we need a new story for climate, because that is what we are creating, we are creating a new story for our civilization. And we need all of us to get in the game and change that story. And I could not be more excited to pass this to Microsoft, who has announced some really exciting things. Um, so awesome to have them as a partner in creating a climate fit for life. Thanks, Mikhail. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, and Liz, I've just passed the slides to you. Great. Great. And can you all hear me all right? We can. Okay, fantastic. And can you see my screen? You can? Yes. Yes. Okay. can see your screen. Yes. Great. Great. So as Lizzie um, mentioned in the introduction, um, I'm fortunate enough to run the carbon program at Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for four years and um, came to the company after um, being in the public and nonprofit sectors um, for over 10 years. And to be honest, getting um, sort of frustrated with the pace of change um, in the world on climate action and feeling that um, corporate voluntary action was moving much more quickly and, um, and more decisively, and or at least had the, had the platform to do so. And so i um, very excited that um, last week, as, as Lizzie and Mikhail uh, mentioned, we've, um, we've really uh, brought that hope to reality and um, made a, a pretty bold um, commitment that, um, that will outline our work program for the foreseeable future. Um, if, if not the next decade, then at least the next um, you know, five to seven years. And so, um, I'll tell you about, about that um, by telling you really what matters uh, to us the most is that we um, align with science. Mikhail had it exactly right. Um, according to the IPCC, we, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, if we as a world economy um, stay within a carbon budget of 420 gigatons, we have a 66% probability of uh, avoiding um, a global temperature rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius. And while those odds are not great, we'll take them. We need to take them. Um, we have so much riding on this, um, to say the least. And so we have to act within the next 10 years to really drive um, very significant emissions reduction. And not only that, but actually remove carbon from the atmosphere that has already been emitted. Um, and so for us, although we had been um, carbon neutral uh, since 2012, and we're proud of that, and um, definitely salute other companies that that do that um, and that have adopted that approach. We um, just had to take some humility um, with with our next step and say neutral is not enough. You know, our carbon neutral commitment 
um, is not enough. And so we, um, we can afford to go faster and further because we are um, a large, as you know, <laughs> to say the least, I think it's an understatement to say we're a large tech company. Um, we know that we can go further and faster and, and therefore we should. I'm trying to advance my slide here. Here we go, great. So um, <clears throat> what does that mean for us? Um, we've committed to be net zero by 2030 and carbon negative by 2050. What does that, what does net zero mean? I'll break it down here. Um, it really boils down to an equation of reducing our emissions first and foremost, replacing what we can't reduce with renewable energy or sustainable fuel, um, and removing carbon from the atmosphere through investment in carbon removal projects that cover the remaining emissions. So truly taking one ton out of the atmosphere for every one that we have emitted in the past. And <clears throat> not only will we be net zero across our scope one, two, and three by 2030, we are also going to remove all historical emissions that the company has created since, since its inception in 1975 to be carbon negative by 2050. And that's the real piece. I think that last piece, that emphasis on historical emissions is the one that excites me the most. It's the one that I think excites a number of other people um, because it really comes down to um, what, what we've heard um, developing countries in the global south say about unpaid climate debt. So the idea that we, again, we've had, um, we've had the privilege and um, the blessing of um, economic success in, um, in developed countries and the companies that reside there. And so we, um, we, have, a, we have an obligation, I would say, to, um, to, to, to do our part um, to, to not only um, remove the carbon from the atmosphere that we've emitted, but also to, um, in doing so, to hopefully avoid further catastrophic effects on uh, on those who have the least resources to to cope. Um, and so for us, it's as much, this is as much about climate equity and climate justice as, as anything. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to take any questions about this. There's obviously a lot to this. I'm happy to take any questions about this after we conclude and hopefully we'll leave enough time for that. This show, this next slide just shows um, the in a, in a different depiction, um, what it means for us to be carbon negative by 2030. So the black line, the black dotted line shows our net carbon emissions. You can see that um, as we ramp up our carbon removal between now and 2030, um, the line begins to, to decline. And then by the time we hit 2030, it starts to, starts to dip below the, below the x-axis there. So um, this covers, as I mentioned, this covers not only our scope one and two emissions, but also our scope three emissions. So that in and of itself is exciting. Um, that's a very um, big task. And I'm, <laughs> I, I came, came to work early today because I have a very big, <laughs> we have a very big work program ahead to source, um, source this scale of emissions, source the scale of um, carbon removal in the coming years. And um, we're really looking to do so in a very principled way. Um, and so, to me, um, that means what investing in the projects, in the types of projects that are scalable to meet the global need, um, affordable for corporate investment, commercially available in the next five years, and most importantly to us, verifiable under greenhouse gas accounting standards. Um, there are a number of different types of removal that we could pursue um, to boil it down into just two. There's really natural climate solutions or biological sequestration, which I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with. That's the typical type of um, offset or, or removal project that we've, we all um, are well aware of. And then there's, of course, the, the engineering um, solutions. And so then that includes things like direct air capture and um, carbon capture and storage and carbon utilization. And I think that there's been um, a real shift. I'll just say, having been a sort of a um, self-described green, deep green environmentalist and a climate activist before joining Microsoft, I had to go on my own um, personal journey around embracing engineering solutions. But I think that as the IPCC 1.5 degree report 
had a sobering impact on on all of us. It definitely had a sobering impact on me with the realization that we we cannot just rely on one type of carbon removal project to or one type of carbon removal to um, achieve this achieve goals like this. We have to have um, a variety of of tools at our disposal in order to um, in order to achieve ultimately negative emissions. And I think the World Resources Institute did a really nice job in a paper series that they published, um, I want to say a year and a half ago, um, in this graphic you can see here up in the left that shows that in order to get um, below zero, we need we need a variety of different um, a variety of different removal approaches. And I recommend. I'm happy to actually it's it's um, included here. So if you guys want to screenshot this um, this slide, you can find this. Uh, this paper series at WRI's website. Um, another really good resource, which is um, um, on ncia.com, um, shows the different um, technical potential of different types of removal, uh, of different classes of removal. And I think that that's, um, you know, as we get into this, I think one thing that's really important, one thing that's not on this slide is how do we ensure that these investments are safeguarded um, against unintended consequences? Um, and really try to be thoughtful about how we invest in these, whether it be soil um, or engineering. And I'll just to take take a minute on that, investing in soil projects um, could potentially, you know, down the road have um, have rapid expansion of um, really valuable um, agricultural carbon sequestration, but um, also need. Uh, keeping in mind that we really need to be aware of potential impacts on land use and forests. Um, vice versa, um, afforestation and reforestation have trade-offs with soil um, carbon sequestration and, and agriculture. And so really thinking about and really relying on um, the, the scientists, the, the accepted science and the NGOs who are constantly diving deep on this is going to be crucial. And for us, that's a really big part of our roadmap going forward is to forge those partnerships um, who can, you know, who can advise us on ensuring that these investments are not going to have, not going to have negative consequences down the road. That's, that's true, especially in the engineering space, as we think about really um, technological removal of carbon, how do we do so in a way that's truly, um, truly verifiable on a life cycle basis, that's not just greenwashing, um, how do we do so in a way that doesn't, um, yeah, that, that that I won't go into great detail on this, but that that um, that doesn't have unintended consequences. So um, this to us is is the loose roadmap going forward. Um, I invite any and all of you to comment, to um, drop us a line um, at Microsoft if you are interested, if you have alternative thoughts about how to proceed. Um, we are really at the ground floor of mapping out our um, decade long, decade plus um, carbon removal journey. And I think we all um, we all know that urgency demands that we, we do this together and we do this in a way that is um, thoughtful and scientifically based. So my, that, that my presentation's a bit shorter, but I wanted to leave some time um, for conversation and um, just welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. That's fantastic. And Mikhail, we really appreciate the, the comments that you've given and really hearing about your leadership roles and how you've gone about doing this. So um, with that, we're going to hop into the Q&A session. Do again, please put your, your questions in the chat function. I'm collecting those. Um, and just want to get things rolling um, with a question. This goes to Liz at Microsoft. Um, the, the exciting announcement last week about being carbon negative by 2030. I'm curious about the tactics to reach that goal in terms of guidance. Um, at this point, the guidance for being net zero and even going carbon negative is um, is a bit lacking. And so I'm just curious about the, um, the steps forward that you'll take as standards bodies and NGOs are developed to help provide that type of guidance for these companies like Microsoft that are really taking this next step and um, whether or not you're playing a role in the formation of that guidance. 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and definitely one that we wrestled with all of the past year. Um, we, we set a science-based target um, in, well, we set a science-based target over the past several years, but got it adopted last summer and announced it in September. Um, and in the course of that process, really started to dig into, could we sign the 1.5 degree pledge, which by the way, I forgot to mention, we, we did sign. Um, we, in the course of doing so, we um, chose the net zero commitment path as a way to fulfill the 1.5 pledge, knowing that, yeah, there's, as your question implies, there's a lot of ambiguity um, from what the NGOs are saying um, counts. Right. And so for us, we just got back to basics. We said, OK, well, net zero to us means just on a very literal basis, removing a ton of carbon from the atmosphere for every ton that we emit and, and doing so in a way that emphasizes reductions first and foremost and really only um, invests in removal for those residual emissions on our way to to trying to zero out, um, zero out our, our emissions. And so. It's, it's that simple, of, for us, it was that simple of an equation. And yes, there's a lot of ambiguity in the NGO space right now around whether that's um, acceptable, but we just said, okay, well, we, we know our executives are on board. Um, we wanna help, if we can, we wanna help drive clarity. So yeah, I will be um, sitting on the carbon removal work group of the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, hope maybe there are some other comrades on that, <laughs> on the call, other people who are part, work, work group members of that. Um, but yeah, that's that's our that's our um, approach is to is to try to hopefully you know show up in this space of ambiguity and maybe with our actions and with our practical experience hopefully help drive some clarity. Liz, thanks so much, and that's a great point that you bring up. For those of you who don't know, um, the WRI GHG protocol is undergoing a process to um, reconsider the guidelines. And there are a number of, uh, of working groups that have formed, one of which is the carbon removal group. So there's going to be a reevaluation of whether or not um, land-based removals should be encompassed within the, um, the reporting of, of companies um, under the WRI GHG protocol. So an exciting time for that. Um, we just got a question in asking, um, saying kudos to Microsoft and saying, can you talk about how you measure the historical carbon emissions from the company to take responsibility for it as a carbon debt? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, we, um, and we welcome, first of all, we welcome feedback on this, much like my other comment. We want to work with people to help develop a, a better practice for estimating historical emissions. We obviously didn't go back to, as one of my colleagues said, we didn't go back to Bill Gates and Paul Allen's garage in Albuquerque, New Mexico, <laughs> before they moved to Redmond. We didn't go back to their garage to find out their electricity bills. Um, we, we, we actually calculated our historical emissions um, based on um, a, a, com a combination of revenue intensity and employee intensity, um, revenue car carbon intensity and employee-based carbon intensity. And, and then we um, sort of from that interpolated what we what um, was seemed like a reasonable um, historical footprint from 1975 to 2011 up until we had made our carbon neutral commitment in 2012. So simple, simple approach. But um, I mean, I think that there's probably uh, undoubtedly some more rigor that could be brought to that, um, you know, over time. And I think for us, it was um, we tried to take a very simple and transparent approach that our executives could understand since there's real money behind that. Thank you. Great. Okay, one one more quick follow up. Sorry, Liz, and then we'll we'll shift over to Mikhail. But um, question about Microsoft in, incorporating scope three emissions, and if that is a part of the carbon negative strategy, and if it's not part of the initial strategy, will it become part of the strategy in the future? Yep, it is. It is. So back to this slide. I know I moved through these slides quickly, but we are we're committing to um, reduce our scope three emissions 55% by 2030 relative to a uh, FY17 base year. And that's um, again, part of the um, part of the 1.5 degree pledge um, after reducing or in, in the course of reducing 55%, um, we're going to cover the rest um, of that scope three footprint through carbon removal projects. So again, net zero, car net zero scope one, two and three by 2030. Great, great, thank you. 
Um, there's a question about policy advocacy. And um, I know, Liz, you just mentioned you are on the carbon removal working group for WRI GHG protocol, which is more of kind of a nonprofit standards body that, that creates the rules. Um, but this is kind of a question I think aims for um, both, both you, Mikhail, and Liz about whether or not the companies that are engaged in, in um, deep reductions are interested in policy advocacy as well, or is it more of trying to get peers and other companies on board for making voluntary commitments? I would say both. We're, <clears throat> we don't, you know, have a head of government affairs. We aren't, you know, experts in lobbying, but we have, especially Ray Anderson, our founder, was very active in, in doing this at the federal level years ago. Um, not quite succeeding and on the <laughs> climate change bills, as you might recall, in 2008 and 2009. But we're really going to, you know, consistent with our strategy of this needs to be all of us. One of the key ways to scale action is to have you know, the appropriate policy mechanisms. Um, we're going to be looking fairly narrowly this year at state laws where we can incent calculation, you know, purchase, better purchasing. Again, what we, what I talked about at the top is all of these emissions where if we say in, you know, state like California where I live, oh, well, we've reduced our direct emissions from facilities in our own state and haven't addressed our supply chain, we just outsourced all of our emissions to somewhere else and they're still in the atmosphere somewhere. So California a few years created a bill that addressed a few product categories called Buy Clean California, where they actually had to consider the carbon footprint in state purchasing. We think that's a model that needs to be scaled up and applied to a lot more categories of high footprint products that are purchased by big purchasers, state of California being one of the largest, you know, short of the federal government um, to really start to, again, keep score on carbon emissions. We're not going to send the right message to our supply chain if we're not even keeping score. So we're really excited to expand approaches like Buy Clean California. Um, we had a bill introduced last year in Washington for Buy Clean Washington. We're hoping to get lots more support behind that this year. Um, and then also to expand things like Buy Clean California to other states, but also to other product categories. Really only covers three products categories within buildings needs to include a lot more. Yeah, and Lizzie, I can jump in on this as well. Um, I did not mention policy in my presentation because I was focused just on our carbon negative commitment, but we, um, I encourage everyone to take a look at our blog from last week. We definitely um, are doubling down on using our voice on carbon um, related public policy issues. And so that for us includes four things, um, at least four things. One, um, expanding global basic and applied research efforts on carbon um, to removing regulatory barriers to help catalyze markets to enable carbon reduction technologies. Um, three, using um, market and pricing mechanisms uh, such as carbon pricing to help people and businesses make more informed decisions. And three, and four, um, empowering consumers through transparency to help um, inform purchasers about the carbon content of goods and services. And so Mikhail mentioned, for example, the EC3 tool that we've partnered on with, with um, Interface and Skanska and the University of Washington, and that falls immediately in that category. So those are just a few, that's kind of a lightning, lightning speed tour of our public policy commitments, but. Great, great, thank you. And I think we um, hope that having of... better tools like EC3 will, will enable us to point policymakers to the fact that you can measure these things and you can make better decisions at the, the large policy scale. Fantastic. Um, question that's kind of basic, but for, for listeners who might be at the really initial stages of having their company tackle this, how do you even get the ball started rolling? How do you um, how comprehensive was your first footprint? How did you get the internal buy-in to go about doing it? And what was the largest obstacle encountered? And I do realize that, that the greenhouse gas efforts at both of your companies have been uh, long-standing. So this may predate when you were there. But if you do have any kind of advice or thoughts, suggestions for how companies that haven't done anything can just get the ball rolling, that would be great. Mikhail, do you want to take a crack? I'm happy yeah. to try. 
I, I did my homework here and went and asked someone who was there. <laughs> Um, because yeah, I was not there when we did our first pr footprint, which would have been 96, 1996. I definitely was not at Interface. I was still studying environmental science um, in the nice college undergraduate. Um, we started out with looking at how could we get our, we have all these salespeople out there driving cars. How do we get that to carbon neutral? So that was what we started out with back in 2002. We had a cool fuel program to try to offset the emissions from all of our salespeople driving around all the time. We did the trees for travel program. And then we started realizing, which all companies that really do their calculations, realizing that our, our big impact was in the supply chain for the raw materials to make our product. And so that was when we created the cool carpet program back in 2003, um, partnering with Blue Source all the way back then. <laughs> um, so that was how we got started. We, we kind of started with what were the most obvious emissions, which were from transportation. Turns out that's a really tiny percentage of our actual impact, and we had to kind of figure out how to scale up and get you know, our arms around these much bigger impacts in our supply chain. Um, one of the things we did to engage our, our people, uh, the Cool Carpet Certificate, which I showed you an image of, gave the salespeople a reason to go back and visit their customers and to present them with their, and to share this positive story about reducing the impact of the product they bought from us. Uh, that definitely helped us get some traction um, for the program. Um, you, you forever have to go in and figure out what language does your organization already speak? And in our case, you know, sales visits to customers, customer touches, and that's the language we already spoke. How do we put climate into that? Um, you know, again, how comprehensive was the first footprint? At the time, we felt it was very comprehensive and we used the best data available. And of course, you kept realizing we could get better and better. And I think that's the approach. You have to do a footprint enough to get you strategically understanding what your hotspots are. But I don't think having the perfect footprint is, is important, just getting the ball rolling. You have to know what matters, what are the low hanging fruit, but also what are the big elephant in the room style challenges that might not be so easy for us that was the production of virgin nylon plastic from crude oil to make carpet fiber which we did not do in-house and so it took a lot of engagement of our supply chain it was not easy but that was the elephant in the room for us thank you Mikhail. liz i don't know if you have any thoughts on that happy to move on um but if you do I'll give you the mic now Sure, happy to, yeah. I mean, I think the bottom line is customers and investors and the NGO stakeholders representing the general public care about climate change. I think that's become super clear. I, I'm hopeful that Microsoft's commitment will um, encourage its encourage our suppliers to, to drive change. So, um, you know, look to your, look to that universe of folks and take their temperature and, use that as an opportunity to um, to persuade your executives. I think that's the writing is on the wall that that business is changing. I mean, the the, the biggest success for me last week, frankly, <laughs> was hearing um, our CEO Satya Nadella say on CNBC, and I encourage you to take a look at this if you haven't to say to Jim Cramer on CNBC um, that capitalism in order for capitalism to survive businesses need to adapt to climate change and to prepare for climate change by reducing their emissions. And that's a pretty big statement from the CEO of one of the world's largest companies. It, it was pretty, pretty significant. And I think it's just based on reality of science. So um, I, I don't know that, you know, I think maybe simply forwarding that around is, is a persuasion point enough, but not to be glib about it. I know that there's a lot of work that goes into persuasion, but um, that's at least one point. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about which which voluntary initiatives Interface and Microsoft are a part of, whether it's we are still in, we mean business. Liz, you mentioned the 1.5 degree commitment. Um, and so just wanna give you all the floor to, to tell us which initiatives you're a part of and how you chose those. Sure, Mikhail, I'm happy to jump in on this one. Um, for starters. Yeah, why don't you jump uh, in? I'll yeah. 
So, um, yeah, we, we really take the lens of um, what are the organizations that are advancing, um, advancing the conversation or advancing practical tools for companies to operate in line with climate science. Really, truly, everything does come down to climate science for us. I think that's partially because we're a data company, um, a data and tech company. We're, we're founded on science and technology, but also because our chief environmental officer is a conservation ecologist by background and has sat on many a climate science committee. Um, I also have a science background. Um, and so for us, that's the bottom line. And so the NGOs that really are the custodians of that conversation to us are um, the World Resources Institute, CDP, WWF, TNC, um, the coalitions that, that are the sort of, again, custodians of those, those movements are 1.5 degree pledge, science-based targets initiative, um, we are still in, we mean business. Um, those, are, those are definitely the ones that we are part of. And that's not to say others aren't important, but, um, and it's not to say those are perfect either, because I think there's, you know, um, there's a lot of work for all of us to do, including, including NGOs, but those are the ones that we think are really strong. And I would say our challenge as a much smaller company is to decide, and just based on our capacity to meaningfully participate in these, which are are we part of? It's easy if it's something just that we just sign on to. We certainly signed on to. We are still in. Um, but really, we're you know already 100. We're committing all companies committing to use 100% renewable electricity and or or energy in general. So there's thermal energy too. That's that's an exciting one to get a lot of companies making a serious pledge you've got you know, 200 and over 200 companies made that pledge last i've seen a lot of really big companies um you know so our challenge is really you know capacity how do we make the most out of our limited ability to push forward on these things again we're focused on some state legislation science-based targets we haven't really participated in because science-based targets is still very much a conversation about what's my percentage of responsibility? I love that it's science-based, but really we need to all be doing as much as we can. Our science-based target is to be a, across the whole supply chain, all scopes to be with no offsets, carbon negative by 2040. That's really the target we need to be looking at. It's not about what, what level of reduction is my share based on science. It's how much can I contribute to solving the problem? So some of these things I think were more aligned with than others, um, but obviously they're all important initiatives if we engage in them with the spirit of actually solving the problem. Uh, another one I would say on here, UN Global Compact, we are engaging in that simply because there's a lot of great companies in there that we would love to see be even more aggressive with their goals on climate. And so we've joined that in order to influence more than anything. Great, thank you. Um, question about the internal price of carbon or the shatter price of carbon used at Microsoft and Interface and how that affects decisions that are made as well as how that might fund internal or external um, reduction opportunities. Sure, so yeah, Microsoft does not have a shadow price. We have just, we have an actual price that we charge and that we, on which we collect revenue. Um, we've had that since 2012, and then we expanded that um, this year um, to $15 a ton last April. And then in the most recent announcement last week, we've expanded that to um, cover our entire scope three. And so we're looking forward to seeing how that does change behavior in our scope three in our supply chain, potentially um, TBD on that one. But we know to date that that $15 a ton on our scope one and two emissions um, has in fact in, encouraged our um, internal business groups to start purchasing their own renewable electricity so that they can avoid paying our carbon fee. So that's been a pretty cool, that's been a pretty cool thing that's happened. Um, we had, we were sort of working with them to guesstimate what that price point would be. Um, and $15 a ton is, is right. It's apparently the sweet spot. So they've been starting to procure renewables on their own without our subsidy. And we're hoping to have some sort of similar, hopefully have some sort of similar um, dynamic with the scope three carbon fee going forward, such that our internal business groups will want to start to avoid that 
and then invest in their own decarbonization. I love that. I love that approach. We do not have as formal a price on carbon as Microsoft does. As I said, our our main driver on price is the fact that we promise that every product will be carbon neutral for its full life cycle, and that adds you know pennies per square yard to everything we sell. But it actually actually surprisingly has changed some decisions when we were trying to figure out how to get renewable gas, you know, because renewable electricity can be bought in most places in the world. For the right price, we got an arrangement to buy renewable gas, and it was very, very close. And it wasn't until we couldn't hit our hurdle rate to actually invest in that, until we realized that we didn't have to buy the offsets on that energy use, and we actually that made us get that last little bit down to hit our hurdle rate. So, even again, and this is the lesson that I've seen is that the fact that we have no national price on carbon. It's such a missed opportunity because even a small price on carbon like ours changes big decisions that are made in the company. These small percentages are determined. You know, we've got to get it to two percent, or we can't do it. Ah, uh, it's at three, or it's at two point five. A small price on carbon, whether internal or external, changes those decisions. So we have to, we have to start internalizing these costs, even if we don't get them perfectly at first, because they do change decision making. Thank you. So, a question now about sourcing offsets and how you make sense of the complex landscape in terms of the standards and the different offerings. And um, then, once you have chosen which offsets you're going to support, how you communicate that externally and help with any perception challenges that may exist with the sourcing of offsets. I can address that quickly. I mean, we, ours is, you know, at least a three-part strategy. One is the first part of our carbon neutral flourish program is to eliminate all the emissions we can within our within our supply chain. Huge wins with some some suppliers, getting them to understand that we are measuring their carbon footprint as our carbon footprint, and we have granted global supply deals to you know to companies that got on board with that. Who are maybe regional suppliers, and it basically become part of our procurement process for raw materials if they can reduce their footprint. So again, then we get to buy less offsets. Once we're into the stuff we can, can't currently eliminate, that's when we start looking for, you know, pro we look for a, we, we're a global company, and so we want there to be something in every region where we can say for people who are buying in Asia, oh yeah, we have we support offset projects in Asia. They all have to meet these. You know, verification of the standards. We we have certain um, markets we have have preference for, like market or APX, um, to know that they're fully validated, verified, and accounted for properly. In addition to that, the project was legit. Um, and you know, and then finally, we like to be able to take that story to market in a way that it engages the customer and has them think about what else. Could we be getting carbon neutral that we buy every day, not just our flooring? Um, that's why we like to do the, the carbon neutral floor certificates to the customers to really get them engaged and thinking about how could they have this kind of win in other categories. I don't have any further comments to make on that. Great, thank you. There was a question about whether or not Microsoft will invest in technology in order to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. Yeah, so one big piece of our of our announcement last Thursday that I did not include in my presentation was um, that we uh, are also launching a $1 billion um, investment fund in decarbonization and removal approaches. And that will be an external fund, um, com totally separate from our carbon fee. That'll be um, use of Microsoft capital um, to invest in um, companies that are driving innovation in those areas. And so, yes, um, the answer is yes, we will be investing in companies that remove carbon from the atmosphere in innovative ways. And I think there was another question I saw um, related to this, which was how do we govern, um, how do we govern the potential unintended consequences of investments like that? And I, that's been something very much on my mind. I think we, you know, we're looking to partner with um, NGOs and other Third-party experts to really ensure that um, 
you know, we have a global roadmap for how to pursue this and, and not to think too, not to think too far ahead, but really be thoughtful about not taking too much carbon out of the atmosphere. I mean, that's a problem. You, you know, it's hard to imagine that problem at the moment, but it is, you know, one scenario. And so really thinking hard about how to proceed um, in a way that doesn't, um, yeah, doesn't have unintended consequences. So fortunately or unfortunately, wow. we are a long way from having that problem. But I, I do think you can look at some of the unintended ripple effects, like some of the bioplastics and fuels rippling into to food pricing issues. And so we always need to be careful about that. At the same time, especially leveraging natural carbon sinks, there's so much great work to do before, you know, we're even going to become close to the problem. The other great thing is we have better and better sensing mechanisms for sensing, you know, changes in carbon emissions, even on a very local basis based on, on low altitude satellites and other technology. So we're going to get better and better at sensing how we're changing carbon emissions. And hopefully that will create some great feedback loops to have us do more of what's working and less of something that isn't working. Thank you, Liz, for addressing both of those questions. Um, well, with that, uh, we're going to conclude the webinar. Liz, Mikhail, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to all the listeners for all your time. Really appreciated the conversation. And we will be sending out a recording to everyone who registered. So um, while the slides won't be sent separately, you will get a recording that does have the slides in it. And um, we just encourage all the corporates who were on the line today to um, to take action, and if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to me or Liz or Mikhail with questions, because we certainly do want to encourage more action in this area. So thanks again, and, um, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Mikhail. Really appreciate it.